All right, everybody, uh, good morning or good afternoon as the case may be. It is 11 o'clock by my watch in Chicago, so it's time to begin. Thank you for attending this PowerCast, Expert Tips for IBM I by Tom Huntington, Enneris Terrell, and Chuck Lezinski, all of Help Systems. This PowerCast is sponsored by Help Systems. My name is Ian Carwright. I'm Education Manager for Common, and if you experienced any technical issues during the presentation, go and send me a message through chat. If you'd like to send the presenters written questions uh, that they'll answer at the end of the presentation, for that, you're going to want to use the Q&A app. It is located down at the bottom of your screen near chat. Uh, presenting today are Tom and Aris and Chuck. Tom Huntington is Executive Vice President of Technical Solutions at Help Systems and has been with the company for nearly 30 years. Chuck Luzinski is Director of Technical Solutions for Robot Product Line, has been with Help Systems for over 20 years and has over 35 years of experience in IT, including 30 plus years in the IBM I platform. And Aris is a Senior Consultant in Information Security and Automation. She has a degree in Systems Analysis and she has specialized in IBM I since the beginning of her professional professional career, becoming one of the most recognized IBM I experts in Latin America. With that, I'm going to hand control over to Tom Huntington. Tom, go ahead. Thank you, Ian. And I'll just throw in two, Amneris and I are also IBM I power champions, or just IBM power champions. And Chuck is uh, vice president of our local Q users. So if you're interested in user groups and or power championship, I guess you can call it, give us a, give us a call, give us an email drops, text, something like that. So help systems, um, obviously we're known for our automation and cybersecurity technology around IBM I, but what you might not know about help systems is that in today's world, we can do infrastructure and data security for the entire organization. We help people out with vulnerability management, um, pen testing, offensive security, that kind of uh, fits into there too. So we do pen testing, simulations, vulnerability scans, website scans. We also do a lot with email security, phishing protection, brand protection, you know, business email compromise. We do data protection. Uh, we, when we think of IBM I, we think of structured data, DB2, that kind of thing. Well, in this case, we're talking about even unstructured data protection and data loss prevention, data classification, digital rights management. We also help protect your brand, whether it's a financial institution or whatever business you may be in, in the World Wide Web with protecting you with digital risk protection. And then of course, secure file transfer. And many of these offers, offerings are available as a managed service and or as perpetual hybrid type solutions working on premise and in the cloud. So move on ahead to the whole, the whole portfolio from Help Systems. Um, we have a lot in cybersecurity these, these days for IBM I. We'll highlight a few things later on in today's presentation. But again, keep us in mind for your entire organization when it comes to cybersecurity. And also don't forget about automation. Um, we do help customers with robotic process automation, enterprise scheduling, workload automation, VM capacity planning and monitoring, document management. And then we do a whole host of those things for IBM I. And if we move to our next slide, that's where we get to backup and recovery and high availability help systems uh, helps customers out with both of those areas, document management, forms overlays, um, web forms, scanning documents, all those kinds of things, cybersecurity, monitoring systems, business intelligence, capacity planning. If you're looking at Power 10, we help people out in sizing their servers. And of course, automation. Robots started help systems some 40 years ago and uh, and automation has been part of our game ever since then. So if we go on to our agenda slide here today and over to Amneris to cover yes. that. Yes, thank you, Tom. Good okay, morning. The top Good morning. <laughs> the topics that we are covering today, we should start with IBM I and power technology improvements, and then we will move forward to technology tips and security tips. So very interesting topics today. So Tom, let's start with the uh, technology improvements. Yes, let's uh, go on to the first slide, which is the top IT initiatives and concerns from last year's marketplace survey. By the way, the survey is still open until the end of October. We hope that you can fill this out and go into www.surveymonkey.com or if you're connected with me on LinkedIn, you'll find it under one of my posts. 
but uh, we do do the survey. It's our ninth year. Um, the last four years, we've had pretty similar results when it comes to top IT concerns, cybersecurity being number one, high availability, modernizing applications, and IBMI skills. We'll kind of work a lot of that into our presentation today as we go through uh, tips for IBMI. Back to you, Amneris, to mm -hmm. talk about and look back on IBMI. Yeah. Let's, let's take a look to what happened in the recent time previously. And as everybody knows, security is more and more challenging every day. And for the IBMI platform, that's not an exception. And we have the Log4j issue last December, and that made clear to us that the IBMI is vulnerable. We knew that already, but this brought a lot of situations that make us take more uh, aware of that. Pandemic, what to say about that? We have changed the way of working and many other things that we were doing in, in previous time. And now working from our home remotely, it's almost the norm. Uh, talking to customers, most of them are having a hybrid environment or they just work from home. So that's really a challenge in, in a lot of, of topics that we are gonna cover today. And of course, Power 10, new hardware, more processing, a lot of new features, more security in, in, the, in the hardware itself and new operating system 7.5 with a lot of uh, new uh, topics uh, that are bringing us a better and more secure environment. So um, that's what we have today. And we know that this is happening. And let's see what about support, Tom? Yes, thank you, Amneris. You know, one, th one of the great things about IBM is they provide a roadmap on operating system levels and the support longevity of them. And you'll see as we sit here in 2022 that um, even 7.2, uh, you can still do an extended support on that. And then 7.3 is going to be end of marketing here coming up in 2023. So, but each of these operating systems, you can kind of look at a 10 to 11 year span where IBM supports the operating system. And we know that 7.5, as Abneris points out, came out here in May. So uh, IBM is already working on the next operating system level. So let's move on to our next slide here. And we talk about um, the power platform too, because the other question that management always has is, what about the future of the hardware? What about the future of the operating system? And these two items here to me really help steer what's available. Today, as we know, Power 10 was announced and delivered partially in 2021 and now in 2022 with the rest of the family that we'll show you here shortly. And IBM today is at a seven nanometer processor and are working on, I believe now next four nanometers is what we probably will see in the Power 11 technology. But the point of the matter is uh, this group has done a great job of keeping up with technology and building a scalable, reliable server along the way. Let's move on to our next slide. And here's the current family of Power 10, 10 servers. Now they have a complete family of servers out for us today in the marketplace. Uh, first came out the E1080 for the really big environments. And uh, believe it or not, there's customers definitely running E1080s uh, and um, business partners and hosting companies that are running those technologies. The E1050 is a AIX Linux only. Uh, I know we often hear gripes from the industry saying, why not for IBM I? Um, I'm not really the hardware guy at help systems, so I'm not sure exactly why that is for E1050. But of course, we got the 1024, the 1022, and the 1014 to reach out and fit the market needs for our customers because we can run IBM I, AIX, Linux on these servers. And you know, if we look at the memory today, um, you know, 16 terabytes per node memory on the high end servers to meet workloads like HANA on power. And I think the beauty, you know, of, of this whole evolution with IBM and sharing multiple operating systems and different LPARs has been really good because of the amount of different technologies that can run on the IBM power platform. 
Off to our next slide. One of the other things that we saw here is system subscription. This was new here um, in the August, September timeframe. And this is really meant to bring a cloud-like experience to an on-premise customer. And so what IBM is basically doing is bundling up platform as a service, PA, pass for IBM I applications on-prem. And that is, this is a, a four core S1014 with one IBM I core active and 64 gigabytes of memory, basically giving you the ability to have a fully subscription type environment for your IBM I server. And then down on the right, they compare it to the cost of your cell phone on a monthly basis. You're basically getting an IBM I server for $50 a month. And now that I think about it, I, th I think I might just get one of those and, um, and have that just like my cell phone. I don't know if I'll be able to carry it around, but anyways. Virtual serial numbers also came out here in the 2022 season, and this is meant to address customers and the cloud environment and that instead of being tied to a serial number, you could have a VSN number, a virtual serial number that would live with you and your um, rights to the operating system so that if you moved into a hosting provider, your virtual serial number would go with you and not be tied to an actual physical serial number. Okay, and there's two main reasons. If we go to the next slide, the, the idea behind this is that when you go to the cloud or you go to an MSP, they may want to move your partition around depending upon the usage and consumption of the hardware. So that's the biggest thing you got to think about is when you go into a cloud offering, whether it's a MSP kind of offering or a true cloud offering, there's always a chance that your partition may be moved around and then hence your serial number of your software doesn't work. So VSN is meant to help provide a virtual serial number that the software, I know like the help system software, we will look at the VSN um, instead of the actual serial number for licensing purposes. But anyways, this is uh, the, the biggest limitation here though, is it's tied to the HMC. The HMC has to be able to see both frames or multiple frames that could be sharing this virtual serial number. You have to talk to IBM to get your virtual serial number if you are in a situation where you're going to be moving to the cloud or to an MSP and LPM or um, moving partitions around as part of what you're going to be doing. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look then to the Power 10 topic and let's try to think what Power 10 means to me, to you, to your organization. It's just uh, more powerful system. It's just more uh, the processor capacity. When moving to Power 10, do you uh, do that with best practices? Do, do we improve what we are doing today or do we do exactly the same thing, but with a more powerful system? So that's, that's our questions that we should take in mind when, when upgrading or moving. And from help systems perspective, we have two recommendations. Uh, one more related to operations and the other to security. So uh, IBM I, it's moving forward. It takes a lot, a lot of advantages, new features. So we must review the current state in order to benefit from those improvements. So. Uh, that's something that we are going to go through right now. And the other topic, it's security. IBM I is facing more and more security challenges. I already talked about that. So we must plan a strategy to reduce and mitigate risks. So uh, let's move forward then. But before going uh, with um, the, the issues, thank you, Ian, for the poll. Um, we want to know from you, what version of IBM I are you running? 7.5, 7, 7, You can select more than one. So please uh, provide that information to us just to know this state. Where are we? What is our starting point? If you have uh, several operating systems, just choose all of them. Probably if you are in a migration, project, you may have 7.5 and 7.4 or 7.3 at the same time. So um, please answer. Thank you very much for your response. And let's take a look to that. OK, 
okay, seven, five, six percent, seven, four, 64. That's something that was expected really. And, and this is great. This is very good news. You are already almost in the latest operating system version up to a couple of months ago. So that's great. And for those in 7.2 and 7.1, plan to move uh, whenever you want or whenever you can so that you can take advantage of everything that's coming in each new operating system. So thank you very much, Jan, for the poll. And let's move to the technology tips. All right, thanks, Amneris. Yeah, we're going to jump into some technology tips and uh, we're going to focus on three main areas. We're going to talk a little bit about modernization and some of the new things that are available. We're also going to talk about what I would consider sort of baseline. We're going to talk about automation in terms of job scheduling, operations, storage cleanup, and so forth. And then let's not forget about system performance, monitoring, and some of the tools that are out there to help you do that. So first of all, let's talk about modernization. So Tom Huntington already provided uh, one result from our 2022 IBMI Marketplace survey. And one of the questions we had in the survey was, which development language do you use today for new development on IBMI? And one of the things that we were surprised about 2021 versus 2022 is that there's an even increased use of RPG. Now that is, of course, the primary uh, development language on this platform, but uh, we've seen an, uh, a bump in that number. It's really skyrocketed. And we really think that has a lot to do with what we've been talking about in these various webinars over the last uh, four or five years. We've been talking about some retirement of developers off the platform, and we're looking to backfill with new younger talent that have uh, some skills that maybe we haven't seen. And we've been educating them and mentoring them and giving them the guidance that they need so that they can take on that RPG development environment. And certainly, RPG free format has helped things like uh, rational developer uh, and that eclipse environment has helped in that uh, in that way as well. So RPG is certainly not only hanging in there, but thriving uh, as well as Java, Python and other languages are catching on more and more and that just speaks to the flexibility of the platform. We do want to call out a couple of educators, Jim Buck and Charlie Garino are certainly doing a lot in this environment, as well as Ian and his group at Common with the RPG Bootcamp. And I'm going to make a call out too to uh, our various user groups around the country and around the world. Tom Huntington mentioned our QUser.org, which was a Minnesota user group, but certainly is available um, to anybody who wants to join it since we do strictly remote meetings now. So let's talk a little bit about modern development tools. Of course, for source editing, uh, everybody knows that uh, SEU hasn't been touched by IBM for a very, very long time. So rational developer is really the primary productivity tool for doing software development uh, on IBM I. You've seen a lot of, or we have seen a lot of improvements in this technology uh, since Help Systems has taken over the development of the rational developer tool. And though there is a license fee to use that, I can guarantee you that you will more than uh, quadruple or more the uh, payback on that license fee with programmer productivity. Also with the advent of 7.5, the operating system, there's a new tool available to you and that's Merlin. And basically it allows IBM I to participate in that Red Hat OpenShift conversation. So what is Merlin? Merlin is a tool set and it helps you get to the modernization um, platform that you want to be at. So really what it does is it's a tool set and a set of guides to help you develop in a modern way. So it leverages things like modern free format RPG, Git, Jenkins, various DevOps tools, clouds and uh, the cloud uh, equation and containers, et cetera. And it allows your existing RPG business logic to call those RESTful uh, web services and vice versa. So certainly it's a time to start looking at some of these modern development tools. Tom, let's talk about migration to the cloud. 
Well, this is really a webinar on expert IBMI tips because now we're going to the cloud for modernization. Pretty crazy the, the amount of topics we have for you today. But you know, one of the things that we've experienced is a heightened interest in moving IBMI to the cloud. And I probably have one conversation, two conversations a week with different customers that are thinking about this. And so uh, consequently in the IBMI marketplace survey, we had the question in there last year. We'll have the question in there again this year. Hint, hint, hint. If you haven't yet, please fill out the marketplace survey. Um, last year, uh, we'll see that, you know, you know, nearly 80% of the market still is on premise when it comes to IBMI, but we're starting to see more and more people thinking about it as uh, we have uh, a combination of hybrid and cloud already. So, all right, let's move on to the next slide. And one of the things that we see first of all of interest is moving the HADR or development partitions to the cloud. And it's kind of like, I wanna dip my toes into the cloud experience with power and people are looking for solutions to deliver higher RPO and recovery time objectives versus having uh, two on-premise uh, data centers. They're looking to put a partition on the cloud or move their development to the cloud. That's certainly a great place to start. And as we move forward onto the next slide, one of the things I see playing a big role in this is the journaling technology that exists on IBM I. And if you don't know, um, a couple of things about journaling. It's been around since actually the system 38 days for local journaling. And the whole purpose of this was to build a transactional history of your database updates, changes, and deletes in a persistent environment that is not in memory. So as soon as you write something to a file, it immediately goes out to disk and is stored in the journal receiver as an image. IBM had introduced, because of performance reasons, journal cache API and journal, and which is uh, license program option 42. In 7.5 now, this journal cache is free. So if you're experiencing any kind of performance issues or overheads because of journaling, you might want to look into installing that now. And it's actually back leveled into 7.4 and 7.3, I believe. Um, you know, and journaling is even recommended with hardware replication if you're using Power HA. And that's because of whenever you would have an abnormal IPL, IBM uses the journaling to rebuild your database. We also know people use journaling for auditing. A lot of things going on with security. People want to have a re record of what's changing on the system. Well, one of the best ways is journal your database and you can see before and after images even. And then of course, it's also compatible with field procedures uh, used in, in the, uh, the encryption technology. Well, about 25 years ago, IBM introduced remote journaling. So basically, what this means is that I have my local journal and I have basically a sibling or sister or cousin or whatever image that's on another partition or another system. And automatically underneath the covers, the operating system will deliver the local journal receiver sequences over to the remote journal receiver and it will sit over there. And then in the case of moving to a cloud, what's happening is we, we save our image of our system. We move that to the cloud. While that's being moved to the cloud, we're using a technology like journaling to keep up the local changes. And then uh, hence, then we can bring things up to date once you're in the cloud or using HA or your, whatever you're going to be doing once you go to the cloud production HADR. Okay. So it is the backbone for most of these uh, HA products. So as we migrate data to the cloud, the challenge for IBMI is we're not talking about moving typically 200 gigabytes of data or a terabyte of data. Often we're talking about two, three, four, five, 10 terabytes of data that we need to move from a production partition to the cloud. And so we know doing saves, um, somehow we have to get an image of your environment up into the cloud. So we do a save, we tell the logical replication product, we've done a save, keep the journals, keep journaling, and then we move that data up to the cloud. Well, to move that data to the cloud, depending on how much you have, FTP can be an option. If you're less than one terabyte, we can move an FTP of that in you know, maybe a, 10, a 24 hour period of time and get that up and running. 
But if you're talking much more than that, then we might be looking at something like a file acceleration tool. Uh, we have a technology called File Catalyst from Help Systems that does uh, UDP instead of FTP under the covers. And I won't get into all the nitty gritty on that, but it ends up being faster than your standard FTP. And there's also people that are using physical boxes and they typically call them a data box. There's options from Cisco, IBM, Microsoft. Um, these are have a tendency to be expensive and time consuming because you're physically shipping these, um, I call them basically virtual tape libraries from one place in the world to another to get your data up into the cloud. So a lot of challenges when it comes to migrating your data to the cloud, it can be done. Um, logical replication plays a big role in that. And um, you know because a lot of the, well, the cloud providers do not have tape drives. Okay, that's the biggest challenge. Okay, on to the next slide. Okay, so let's work talk about automate the workloads that you have today in your system. Um, many of you probably are using the native scheduler on the IBMI for submitting jobs, but many of you probably have already experienced some trouble with that because it's not easy to um, define uh, several tasks being linked one with the other with dependencies or if they can run at the same time. So many limitations when uh, working with this scheduler and um, sometimes when talking with, with customers, they complement this scheduler with a spreadsheet where they have all the jobs that they have to run at night, for example, because of that limitation. So we encourage you to move to something newer uh, to modernize what you already have today. And this is an image of one of our tools that may help on that, where you can easily define what jobs should be running, when, which prerequisites each of them they have, when they can run at the same time. Um, normally today, the IBMI is connected with other systems and it, it does not run alone. You need to know what's happening on other systems to start triggering some actions on the IBMI. So uh, an interesting point where modernization should take place, it's about scheduling and, and um, planning all the activity in your system. So let's move to the next topic. Tom, are you there? I am talking okay. away on you, of course. <laughs> um, auto <laughs> so let's take a look at our staffing considerations when we talk about automating operational activities. And, you know, IBMI is, is ran pretty lean, meaning that we don't have a lot of administrators and we generally have a shortage of developers. And so the more we can do productivity wise on the server, to take advantage of giving our, our developers and our administrators the right tools, the better off we are. You know, I mean, look at, uh, you know, thir what, 44% from the marketplace only have one administrator. That's pretty crazy. That's almost 50% of the market. So, yes, yeah, so there's a shortage of staff. So we know that. So moving into the uh, next thing, um, it's even worse if we're starting with this as our point. Right, so if we have a more managing things, traditional way of just green screen IBMI, um, you know, it's great. You can move yourself around pretty quick from these green screens, but becomes an operational issue as we uh, have more and more partitions or more and more systems to manage. So if we go to the next slide, um, one of the things that IBM did with last September, to, especially to to coincide with the log. Log4j, well, actually, it came out before Log4j, but to kind of go along with the need to um, re upgrade your system because of Log4j, they've uh, basically terminated the old navigator. And now the new navigator, um, which can be found here at Navigator for I, um, is a web based interface into the IBMI. So you don't have to, if you have people that are saying, geez, I don't want to be on the platform because of a green screen, um, they can manage a good portion of not almost everything through the Navigator for I. And this is being enhanced over and over again. And again, this came out last September of 2021, actually. So let's move on to the next slide. 
Um, you can even do things that look at QSIS Opera and manage it. But again, it's not automation, it's look at. So um, automation is being able to set it and forget it. And that's um, you know a very key point that we talk about here at Help Systems is you wanna have something that's rule-based to, that is going to take care of just monitoring QSIS Opera and looking at all these errors. You know, you see the various CPF and CPC error messages and being able to pick up on those automatically. Okay, next slide and over to you, Chuck, to talk about SQL services as something yeah. that IBM's working on too. Yeah, and a great segue into the next topic, IBM I services and SQL. I'll point out in the upper right-hand corner of this I Navigator screen, there's a little SQL button. So pretty much everything that you see in the IBM I Navigator screens, you can actually see what the SQL is behind the scenes. And so what uh, IBM has been doing is developing these things called IBM I services. And you've no doubt seen that uh, they've been uh, available for quite a long time now in previous versions of the operating system. And they're getting to be more and more prevalent and they are even enhancing the uh, current services to make them more powerful and to provide more information. And uh, there's a lot of different categories for the various uh, IBM I services. And basically it's, it's uh, uh, an SQL uh, query that allows you to pull data back in a lot of different areas. And some new stuff that uh, is available in 7.5 of the operating system as well as 7.4 are listed here. Command info, hardware info, sysdisk dis stat, uh, uh, audit journal information, you can even create a user index, user space, etc. using these IBM I services. So it's something that you really do need to investigate, especially with the popularity of SQL. That was one of the things that was brought out in our uh, marketplace survey is the, is the uh, prevalence of SQL uh, in our modern development methodologies. So where can you dabble in these IBM I services? Well, first of all, we uh, IBM of course has a lengthy uh, documentation on this topic, but uh, no doubt you're using IBM's ACS to access the system via green screen. And also of course you can do a run SQL script in ACS. And if you open the run SQL script option, there are examples of these IBM I services. And there's uh, many predefined examples that you can take advantage of. So you have the option of actually uh, inserting into your run SQL script, some of these examples that they've created for you, and you can run them and see what the results are. How do you run them? Well, as uh, previously mentioned, uh, you'll see some of this in the uh, new navigator. You can use the run SQL script, the Java interface. Likewise, you can simply run them as a native interactive uh, SQL, just copy and paste uh, into your, literally into your green screen. The idea behind it is though, of course, these are examples that you can customize to your needs. So take a look at the documentation. There might not be, uh, or there might be certain fields that you want to incorporate into the data that's being returned to you. And uh, the IBM documentation will lay out those fields. It's, uh, you know, even if you're not an SQL person, Educating yourself on this and learning a little bit more about it is certainly a, a big deal. And in fact, our Q user user group is having a workshop again on SQL in November. So if you'd like to join our QUser.org uh, group, certainly reach out to me. Now, one of the things about these SQ, uh, SQL services is that they primarily return data. So it returns data to the navigator, it returns data to custom apps. One of the things that we highly recommend is maintenance activities and the automation process behind those for doing things like cleaning up disk storage. So there's commercial applications out there on the market like Robot Space that will actually go out there and do things like clean up old spool files, clean up old IFS objects, delete unused save files, and so forth. So uh, instead of manually going about this uh, and causing yourself a lot of headaches, certainly um, automating those processes should be part of your equation. Okay, so let's move into monitoring 
and uh, uh, system performance. So back to this green screen view, you know, we've all been here, right? And uh, it can be somewhat frustrating, especially if you're in a, uh, an environment with a number of partitions and you're trying to diagnose really what the issue is. So the trend, and this is something I've been working with quite a bit in the last seven, eight years, is people want to see dashboards around their data uh, and around their system performance. And they want it customized to their needs. And there are a number of tools out there, including IBM I Navigator, that'll provide some of this information. These screenshots happen to be four different dashboards from one of our tools in the robot product line that's uh, custom dashboarding and monitoring for your IBM I AIX uh, Linux as well as uh, uh, VIOS, but most important being IBM I and VIOS. So doing real-time monitoring, dashboarding, as well as notification really should be part of your modern approach to managing your system. Don't wait for somebody to call. Now, likewise, on the system, of course, collection services is running. What do you do with that collection services data? And I'll pause there for you to think about that. That data is being collected all the time on your system, and you may not be doing anything with it at all. So there are, there are tools on the market, both commercial as well as IBM um, uh, in Navigator, the performance data investigator, that allow you to look at this data to see how your system is performing forensically. So if you need to go back and maybe do some analysis to see, well, what is harming my system? Uh, what's causing slowdown? Is it a bottleneck in I.O.? Is it a CPU bottleneck? Is it QZDA, SO init, JDBC type activity? Uh, you know, that's the type of, of forensic analysis you can do with this collection services data. The advantage to our commercial tool, Performance Navigator, is that we can automate reporting. We can do things like our second opinion service. You send the data that's collected back to us. And there's an expert on the other end of the line that can help you diagnose what's going on. So two things to keep in mind, real-time monitoring. So think of customized monitoring and notification, live dashboards, multi-partition critical if you're in a large environment. And you should be able to drill down all the way to the offending workload. On the forensic side of it, of course, that's gonna be using collection services. You wanna be able to see not just what's going on with your one partition, but with the frame. Think about supplying reporting back to management and critical is problem determination. And with all the migrations that are gonna be happening to uh, uh, power 10 now, capacity planning is a big part of that equation too. So just pointing out in the robot product line in terms of real-time monitoring, it's called robot monitor. And then for these uh, capacity planning and performance analysis uh, exercises, that's performance navigator. No doubt you may have the performance navigator running on your system right now, and you might not even know it. And there also is a free version. Amneris, let's talk about some security tips now. Let's shift gears a little bit. Okay, sure. Um, about security challenges, you know that there are a lot of malwares everywhere, attacks, criminal acts. We, we hear about that every time. Um, I have experience, personal experience working with customers that did have an accident or um, with, with this type of attacks and uh, they really suffer uh, if, if they don't have a plan on that. So uh, we encourage everybody, let's have a very specific plan of what to do in case you have an attack, and, and, and especially about the IBMI in our situation. And about remote work, you know, it's, it makes um, to be more exposed to, um, to risk, and we should take that in mind. And log4j, don't forget that we need to be in the last patches that the IBM is providing. Um, you know that uh, some tools are vulnerable if you are not applying the proper patches like the ones mentioned here. So access plan solutions, integrated web services service should require those patches to be applied. And old versions, uh, the, the, the suggestion is to uninstall them if possible, because they are not being maintained anymore. And if new vulnerabilities appear, 
no patches will appear for that. And I would just want to clarify something. Jose Exposito has written in the question and answer box saying that uh, I have said previously that the IBMI is vulnerable. And he says that it's a large statement. You should be saying parts of the IBMI are vulnerable. I agree, Jose, sorry for that. I didn't want to, to uh, give panic, uh, but that's true. Part of the IBMI is vulnerable and we should work on those parts. Um, every year in help systems, we um, uh, um, generate uh, the state of IBMI security. Uh, it's a document where we show um, uh, the results of a lot of information that we receive from customers that they share with us about uh, how their system is configured. Uh, this is based on a free security scan that we can run with customers. And in the last study, we, we uh, published this information about uh, powerful users. It is very frequent to find systems where a lot of powerful users appear. A powerful user is someone having a lot of object privilege or security administration. And any of the eight special security attributes are powerful users. And on average, our customers have 244 powerful users. We should try to uh, put this down. Um, uh, probably they don't need that information, that powerful attributes all the time. So we are encouraging not to give those attributes every for, for the whole time, but just only when they need it. 20% um, didn't have the Q security system value uh, in level 40 or higher. They were down there. So uh, again, a recommendation if possible to move to 40. And about, um, the restriction or the control of the access from outside into the IBMI, like FTP, ODBC, SQL, petitions that may come from the outside, only 27% 7, of the customers had a monitoring of that. And same thing for um, malware protection, only 15% having that. So again, uh, a lot of work to do here. And let's, Let's try to think the following. Suppose that your organization suffers a security breach, your systems are exposed or identities are stolen or services are offline. Where is the IBMI there? What we should do is see if the IBMI affected, could be the IBMI affected. So um, many times I hear from um, administrator, please check move forward. Uh, when I talk with administrators, they say, uh, my IBMI is not connected or exposed to the internet, so it will not be affected. Many others say they, they feel that that responsibility it's on the on the network team, and um, they think that we should not do anything special on the IBMI. In many other situations uh, regarding antivirus or malware, they rely on um, products for other platforms to protect the IBMI. So in this case, again, we recommend to um, think in the IBMI as a, as a specific platform that requires specific uh, protection. So um, in this graphic, uh, this is, I, I, we have obtained this from a, an organization about cybersecurity in Canada. Uh, there are many graphics like this, but this is quite simple, where it is showing, in the case of our ransom attack, the different steps that um, the criminals should follow. So there are basically three steps. First, the criminals try to gain access. Then, once they get the access, they try to take control on the systems. And when they already do, they move into the data encrypting, deleting, and so on. Um, all these steps, th th there are a lot of um, protections that we already know for all this to avoid this flow. And there are many tools for that. So um, 
if we, I, I will not go through all the tools here, but um, this graphic, it's interesting because it is presenting the different type of tools that you should use to avoid each step. And as you can see, the, the deeper you go, the few number of the fewer number of tools that appear. And if you go to the bottom, the tools are number three, like logging and alerting, but it's just knowing that it's happening. Or number 10, principle of least privilege, something that we were mentioning before, so many users with all object, we should take care of that. Um, seven, backups, basic, yeah. And, if we want to position our IBMI in all this flow, probably uh, we don't think of the IBMI in the first part, in the gain access part where phishing or brute force, or uh, we don't normally, we don't think that the IBMI should take place there, but probably on the other two layers. And uh, this is where we should be aware of, yeah? just to try to protect our IBMI in this uh, in this area. So um, let's let's go and take a look to the different solutions that we have. And Tom, I give the pass to you to review the access control policy. Well, thank you. I, I think it's really important for people to understand the concept behind exit points on IBMI and why this is important. IBMI is known as a transactional database, the DB2 database that comes with it is storing a lot of sensitive uh, data. And, and we used to always hear IBM talk about it as the system of record. It has you know, financial data, inventory data, retail data, transportation data, et cetera, et cetera. So exit points are set on the system to protect the interfaces that are available and have been available for you know, three decades on the IBMI platform. And that are things like ODBC, JDBC, FTP, SQL, IFS, remote commands, you know, the things that we, we forget about because many of us are still using 5250 green screens to access the system. And I'm here to say, as we've looked at exit points for customers and implementing this technology, we have found surprises where people are, a, attacking the operating system from outside of their own organizations and somehow the bad actor has gotten in through some back door and is trying to even access IBMI and try to do things like FTP but you know sometimes it's it's the accidental errors too I mean with this uh, you could have an end user in Excel open up a uh, file on IBMI and if they have change rights change data rights they can change data right from Excel uh, certainly they can download the data if they have only read rights to the data. So let's move on. Um, exit points are not new uh, at Help Systems. We've been doing it for years through the PowerTech Exit Point Manager. But basically the idea behind something like this is now I can at least have an audit record um, of people using this activity on the system because without a tool that's managing exit points, they'll have no idea. The, the next point, though, is we can make it a control. We can block the activity. And then something else that has uh, been around and thought about on IBMI, but not always highlighted, is the fact that you can have ransomware attack IBMI. I, I, one of our partner com companies or even a customer of ours uh, helps customers out with backup and recovery and all kinds of things. And they have had to do several ransomware restores on IBMI in 2021. And this doesn't go away because it's 2022. It just becomes even more heightened. How does ransomware attack IBMI and encrypt the IFS files? Well, if somebody who has public authority or root access to the IBMI file system can cause you problems and you need to prevent that. And then you also... What um, we've done is looked into how can we prevent it within our solutions. So if you go to the next slide, uh, Help Systems has always been helping out with AV natively on IBMI. And if you look into your system values, you'll see that there's some system values out for scanning the IFS for viruses. Those system values have been on the system for almost two decades. So to think that you couldn't get a virus on IBMI is, is um, 
a misnomer. And so we partnered up with uh, McAfee and deliver the antivirus solution. And then we've added in ransomware to help protect you from that too. And this technology, by the way, is not only IBM I, but it'll run on Linux on power, uh, AIX on power, IBM Z, Linux on x86, and uh, even Solaris. Uh, so on to the next slide. All right, let's talk about security and alerting. And um, part of that is being able to get the data. We talked about the shortage of staff, right? One of the biggest things I see is people spending too much time building compliance reports. As a matter of fact, the compliance part of IBM I should be automated. Um, matter of fact, it should automatically send the reports to the security team or the IT auditors. And with um, compliance, we can automate the process of reading Q audit journal, system values and other things and deliver standard reports for various regulations. And we can do that automatically. We can give you a scorecard. We can highlight system values that are not meeting your baseline by uh, maybe you have you know, basically what we call it best practices for security settings and we can highlight that for you through compliance. On to the next slide. And then another part of this is getting IBM I to participate in the enterprise security. Um, you know, part of that is having a tool that can read the security events like the audit journals, the message queue information, you know, things like from QSIS message, um, application errors, even journaling errors, and be able to convert those to a SIM format that fits into most of your enterprise security technologies like Splunk, Kafka, and even at Help Systems, we even now offer up a managed services so we can be your SIM with our alert logic technology, um, which again runs from, they have a dedicated team security operations center that can help manage those events for you centrally, okay? On to the next slide and back to Amneris to talk about privilege access controls. Yeah, um, we were already talking about so many users having high privileges and systems that we find in our customers. So again, um, is it, po it is possible to handle that in a different way. There are a lot of methodologies like, I don't know, um, um, switching profiles or adopting authority, but sometimes keeping that environment, it's not easy or it's really hard work. So um, we have a tool to um, help on that where that lets you provide those privileges to users, but in a temporary way. So for example, if you have an operator that needs to do a backup and he needs uh, save this, uh, privilege, no need to have that all the time, only during the backup. And, and authority broker lets you do that, or a developer accessing production to uh, solve a specific issue, no need to provide that high level every time. And all the tasks that you do while you gain that access, uh, it's audited. Even if you are in an um, interactive session, all screens that you go through um, are there. Okay, so let's go to next step. And this is uh, authentication using more than one factor. Normally in the IBM I infrastructure, we use one authentic authentication factor. It's user and password. And, and that's something that you know, you know your password. When and in, in this type of environment where you are adding one more, it's something that you have, or something that you are, for example, something that you have could be a virtual token, a physical token, a list of codes, and something that you are, your fingerprint, uh, uh, your recognition of your face. So the IBMI, it uh, has the possibility to, to have this type of authentication. So um, uh, in that case, probably you should be involving um, uh, some other platform to, that doing that other authentication uh, using your mobile or using any device to check that. But the IBM I would check the first factor, the second factor would be checked by, by a third party. And once it comes back with a response, the IBM I would follow letting you enter the system or not. And um, something that sometimes um, overlap or it's another possibility with um, getting a more 
strong authentication, it's the possibility of single sign-on. The IBM I is prepared for single sign-on. So if you already have that uh, implemented in your environment with all other systems other than the IBM I, let's include it with Active Directory, for example, using Carvero. So um, a great project to include the IBM I with a whole company um, security structure. Awesome. Thanks, Amneris. So we're talking about protecting your critical data. So let's let's go down that path of encrypting your data at rest. And specifically, there's a technology that was delivered by IBM in 7.1 of the operating system called a field procedure. So that's how we're going to talk about uh, getting your, your data encrypted and then likewise decrypted. Just to back up a little bit, we, we all, all know what encryption is, you know, it's taking your data and, and changing the data when it sits at rest, but the meaning of the data is still there as long as you have the key. And the type of encryption we're going to talk about is AES encryption, uh, NIST improved, no known attacks, et cetera, very quick for encryption and decryption. But one of the things we run into when we talk about encrypting data at rest at the field level using a field procedure is we get some of uh, some some of our prospects talk about, well, we already have our data encrypted. We have our disk encrypted. Well, guess what, guys? That only protects you if somebody takes the disk out of your hardware and tries to use that on another server. So the hardware is protected, but your data is not. So what we're talking about is basically applying field level rules so that any protocol, FTP, ODBC, JDBC, RPG, uh, native query, BI tools, et cetera, abide by a field level encryption routine. And uh, that's done using what's called a field procedure. And I describe a field procedure as being basically an exit point at the field level. We already talked about exit points at the system level. Now we're talking about it all the way down at the field level. So what we do with our encryption tool, or if you wanna write your own, you certainly can do that, is anytime the data is accessed, in this case, you're seeing a display file field description uh, command, the, the field procedure program listed on that field has to be called. So whether you're putting data into the file or reading data from the file, that field procedure has to be called. All right, that's built into the into built into DB2 on IBM I. That field procedure is now literally part of the file. So what we provide is a solution that takes care of you writing your own field procedure and all the um, flow around that. So we take care of the key management, security controls, using using authorization lists, key rotation, auditing, and so forth. So that when data is written. It's written encrypted, and when it's read, you, you're either authorized to see the decrypted data or potentially some masked version of the data. So this and all those tools that you saw list uh, previously described, we do have a full set of PowerTech cybersecurity solutions for IBM I, as well as our security services. Uh, we know you guys are shorthanded out there, so feel free to reach out to us. And don't forget, we do have our free security scan, and that can get you started on the path to a secure system. Mneris. Yeah, it's just summing up. We have started with two main recommendations, but if we move forward, um, let's do a summary of what we have talked today. Um, so we have suggested to take out of all updated technologies. IBM I has a lot of them, so let's take advantage of that. Modernize your application development. Chuck mentioned Merlin, RDI. Automate workloads and monitoring. Let's take advantage of the performance tools that are already collecting uh, a lot of data. Let's plan better your workload during the night. And regarding security, Review your access control policies, FTP, ODBC, check who is entering, who is accessing those files that are critical for you. Audit your events uh, about security and get, get alerted of that. If, an, if a virus is found in the IFS, you should be notified in real time. Try to <clears throat> establish least privilege rules when possible. 
uh, the most, the, the, the best that you can do is to try to get that, those privileges out when it is possible. Um, take advantage of multi-factor authentication. Remember also single sign-on possibilities. And lastly, um, encrypting data at rest in DB2. That's also a great thing to protect our data. So let's move into the last polling question, Tom. Yes, um, so Ian's gonna put that up in front of you. And if you want additional information on any of these topics, please uh, select um, one of those, uh, system automation, monitoring, HA replication, system access control, security monitoring, reporting, and the final topic being encryption. And I think uh, Ian, um, over to you, it's probably a good time for a couple of questions. I know we're right at the top of the hour and probably should have said something earlier. We apologize, we have a lot of content for you today. Ian, over to you for Q&A. Yeah, let's see if we do have a couple of questions. I, I know if you hadn't seen the questions have been coming in uh, during the presentation, anybody in the audience, go ahead and open up that Q&A panel. You can see that some questions have already been answered uh, via yeah. the text as uh, we went on. Give folks one more second to uh, send in any new questions they may have. While I'm waiting for those, I will say that you can grab the uh, handout, the uh, PowerPoint slides from this presentation, as well as the replay of what happened today. It's going to go up in the Common yeah. Learning Management System. It'll be available uh, by tomorrow morning. Yeah. And I think, Ian, one of the questions that's out there is about, hey, to say IBM I is vulnerable is a large statement. And that's the problem. That exact comment is the problem in the industry. People, we year after year after year, we do these free security scans and we find so many terribly configured IBM I servers. It's not that IBM delivered bad security for the platform. We as administrators and developers have built an environment that's pretty open. And if somebody gets into your network, um, your IBM I is absolutely vulnerable not only vulnerable for malware and viruses and those kinds of things, but it's also vulnerable for people stealing your data because we see uh, physical files, SQL tables that have full access to public. You know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy the amount of things that we see out there. So the platform is vulnerable. Um, it's just lucky for a lot of us that it's kind of hidden behind the uh, maybe the firewalls and, and, and the bad actors aren't necessarily going after IBM I, but um, as we journey to the cloud, things become even more, more open. So um, that's my thought. And I know I'm nearest. I'm not sure what you were thinking when you saw that. Yeah. I didn't want to make anyone to get panic, but, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> uh, but don't panic, but take action. <laughs> Correct. There you go. I mean, it's take action because there are, we, you know, unfortunately, things, you know, the problem is the box has been so reliable and so stable for 40 years that there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, yeah, IBM I is not vulnerable because it's IBM has been telling us for years it's a secured environment, right? And yeah, it is. a lot of misconfiguration. Yes, exactly. And that's your number one issue with most security breaches is misconfiguration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we are a couple minutes after the end. So why don't we go ahead and end there? Thank you, everybody, for attending this PowerCast. Thank you, Chuck, Amneris, and Tom for a good presentation. Well, thank you, Ian. Thank and you. Hats off to Common for bringing such great education to the community. Take Absolutely. care, everyone. Okay, bye. Yep. Bye bye, bye, everybody. Have a good day.